but it's okay. Anyway, I got a few prayer requests or, or updates maybe. Um, the first one is I talked to, to good buddy again today and he said every day he feels a little bit better, but he's still pretty weak. So just pray that he gets a little bit more strength back. But he, he said that he was enjoying this cooler weather and that he was feeling better, just still a little weak. Um, I talked to Sharon McKinney today and Gerald had his port put in yesterday and he's having his second round of chemo tomorrow. Um, so just pray that, that, that the second round of chemo goes okay and that he maybe doesn't have quite as many side effects um, the second time around with the chemotherapy as he did the first. Um, but just continue to pray for Gerald and, and also for Sharon. She's got a lot on her plate right now. And this is wearing heavy on her too. Um, Audrey Pitter fell last Monday at her house and broke a bone in her wrist. Um, and she's doing okay, but she does have to have surgery first thing tomorrow morning here mm. in town. So they're going to put in um, the doctor told her that he believed her wrist would heal, um, you know, with a cast, but he didn't think it would ever be straight again unless they went in and, and did surgery to put in a pin or something like that. So she's having that tomorrow morning at six. And she said that um, she'll get to come home tomorrow. All things considered, she's doing really well, she said. Um, she was grateful that I, she had been going to the Y to do exercise classes and yoga and stuff like that for several years now. So she said when she did fall, she was able to get right back up again, which was a blessing. So um, just continue to remember Audrey. Uh, Angie Taylor had a chemotherapy treatment last week. So just continue to remember Angie and John and little John and Rachel. Um, ben Bridgers has another treatment tomorrow. Uh, his first treatment went well, he said. It wasn't as bad as he thought it was going to be. Um, so I think he was really encouraged by that, but he did say that he's got eight spots that require a shot and it's not just one shot. It's like six shots in each place. So I can't imagine getting like, uh, that's got like 40 shots at least, uh, maybe a little, almost close to 50. I can't imagine that, but, um, he said all things considered he's doing well. So, um, and I think off the top of my head, that that's the only ones that I had, um, does anybody else have any prayer requests tonight? And hey to Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, howdy. Now, I've talked to those same ones you've mentioned. I didn't know about Audrey, though. That's news. Yeah, yeah. It was um, somebody told me that was that normally is in her exercise class at the Y that, that somebody in the class mentioned it. So I called her and and then Susan had talked to her too. So yeah, she said it, um, she said she hadn't really mentioned it to anybody last week because she didn't know um, when, she knew she was gonna have to have surgery, but she didn't know when that was gonna be yet. So she thought she might wait until she found out when the surgery was gonna be to let, to let people know. So I see. <clears throat> she's doing okay. Um, any other prayer requests? Any praises this week? My son got the job. Oh, hot dog. <laughs> yeah, he got he got an apartment. So he said he said to tell everybody thank you for praying for him. Well, good deal. Uh, yeah. That's exciting. Cause I know I, I'd imagine like with everything else going on, that's probably kind of the hard job market right now to try to find right. <clears throat> um, positions and find people that are, are actively hiring. Um, we haven't talked to them in a few days, but um, I know Karen and Patrick both still need our prayers. Coughlin. Yeah. Well, anything else? Well, if not, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for another evening. We thank you for another opportunity to be your people uh, and to spend time together lifting up the concerns of our hearts, uh, the concerns of individuals in our congregation and in our community. Lord, we know that you're a God who is with us in all things, a God who promises to never leave us nor forsake us, a God who dwells within us in your Holy Spirit, Lord. So we know 
that you're aware of the things that we're going through. We know that you're aware of the things that trouble our hearts, Lord, maybe even more intimately than we know them ourselves, Lord. So we just turn these concerns over to you, knowing that you're a God who is at work in all things, making all things new and drawing us closer to yourself and to your perfect will. So Lord, we pray this evening for our church. We pray for all those who are sick or who are hurting or have loved ones who are sick or hurting, Lord. We pray for um, all those who have lost loved ones recently. Lord, we just pray that you would give them a special peace and comfort and rest during this time, Lord. And we just pray that as the body of Christ in this particular place, we would rise up to be the people that they need us to be, to support them, to encourage them, to pray for them, to be the hands and feet of Christ during these difficult days. God, we pray for our congregation. We pray for our church. Lord, may we be attentive to where you're at work in our midst, and may we seek to join you in those places, Lord. And most of all, may we commit ourselves, Lord, to making your name known among our community, especially among the lost in our community, Lord. We pray for our leaders, both locally and nationally and globally, Lord. There are so many difficult things going on in our world, uh, so many challenges facing our leaders, Lord. So we just pray that you would give them guidance and wisdom, Lord, that they would seek after good influences, Lord, to help them make the decisions that they need to make to seek after the flourishing of all, Lord. And we pray um, especially for our weekday school, uh, for all the children that we have with us each day, five days a week, Lord. We just pray that we would do our best to, to minister to them and to their families, Lord, and most of all, to remind them of the love that you have for them and the love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and life that they can find in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, this evening, we just pray that as we turn our attention to your word, that you would reveal yourself to us in a new way, that you would remind us anew that it is you and you alone who give us life and that it's your life that we should seek after with all of our days. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to switch up our normal order of things maybe a little bit tonight. Um, as you might know, on Sunday mornings, uh, starting back two Sundays ago, we, we started this series talking about what it means to worship God. And the first week we talked about what it means to love God, because we said that we worship God when we love God. And then this past week, we talked about what does it mean to love God with all of our heart. And we're using the passage from um, Mark chapter 12. It's also in, in Matthew and Luke when someone asked Jesus, you know, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus's response is something to the effect of, you know, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. So as we think about what does it mean to love God, what does it mean to worship God, we're using this response that Jesus gives as kind of a, a, a guideline maybe of, of how we live worshipful lives. If we can learn to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and if we can learn to love our neighbors as ourselves, then we can live worshipful lives. So this Sunday, we're focusing on the, the second of those five things. When Jesus tells us to love the Lord our God with all of our soul. We're going to talk about what does Jesus mean. Um, and so I want us to talk about that tonight as well. And before we get to our scripture from Matthew's gospel for tonight, I just want us to think about, so my first question um, is, is what does it mean to have a soul? I think that's a term that different people use differently. It can mean several different things, I think. Um, so it's one of those terms you almost have to clarify what you mean by it when you use it. So there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, what does it mean to have a soul? I think it's just our connection to God. Okay, our connection to God. Yes, that's, that's yeah, I definitely think that's a way that, that Christians use it a lot or, or maybe other religious people too. Um, so, yeah, it's our connection to God. Maybe it's our spiritual life is a way we could phrase that. Mm -hmm. What else does it mean? Or how else is it used, maybe? Well, you get into it, then you're asking these other questions, like another way, having an old soul and like that. Is that what you mean to get into that? Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, you can get into that, yeah. Well, 
when you say somebody is a good old soul, you usually mean that it's just a kind hearted person, maybe a forgiving person, someone that thinks of others. If it's a good old soul, it's just we feel like that has all those good connotations. Yeah. So maybe it can be like we, we use the term soul as almost like a, a descriptive uh, about a person's personality or their demeanor or how they carry themselves in the world. So you can be a good old soul. You can be an old soul. I hear that a lot. Um, you can have a restless soul, right? Those are kind of ways that we describe character traits that people have, um, how they carry themselves in the world. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a definitely another way that we use the word soul. Um, is there any other way that you've ever heard it used? Yeah, I was thinking of thinking about that song all day. What? What? I can't. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> remember, I told you that. I you know. did tell me that. Yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. But they refer to it a lot in old music. Huh. Yeah, you know, like you have soul as far as music is concerned. Yeah. Yeah. We, we spent a couple minutes trying to define, you know, what, what is your soul? Um, you know, generally, it's that part that lives on after you die. Um, so it must be our beliefs, our morals, maybe our character. Um, and sometimes when you refer to someone as an old soul, it has positive connotations but usually you just mean they're old yeah I hope you mean as well they are they're wise hopefully they're understanding and most of the time you're referring to someone who's a lifelong learner <laughs> who seeks knowledge um so those were some of my thoughts okay yeah that's interesting yeah spiritually inclined yeah i think um i remember in, in undergrad and even in some in seminary we had to take philosophy classes and if you if you've ever taken any philosophy there's this really famous french philosopher Des descartes that has this you know this prominent theory on the it's called cartesian dualism but essentially you know you have a physical body and then you have an immortal soul, soul essentially, and your soul is what makes you distinctive maybe from other living beings is what Cart um, Descartes said. And, and anyway, that, that kind of permeated Christian philosophy uh, a, a pretty good amount, honestly, about, you know, we have a physical body, sure, that's mortal, um, that's fleeting, but we have a soul that maybe is immortal. And I think I would push back against that a little bit because it's not in keeping with a doctrine of resurrection, in my opinion. Um, but it certainly has had influence over Christian theology in the last four centuries or so. Um, but yeah, one other way I've heard it used a lot is um, like when people look at like bad things that go on in the world and they'll say something to the effect of like, oh, we live in such a like soulless world, maybe, you know, like when we look at brokenness or, or, or like sin that runs rampant, maybe, or, you know, somebody might tell you some heartbreaking story and they expect you to have this compassionate reaction and if you don't they might say something to you like well don't you have a soul or something like that like you know if you had a soul you would have compassion or you would be able to like you know this would bother you or something like that so i do think in, in some ways it also has some connotation that's related to like ethics or morality or like this innate sense of we should that we should have between what's right and what's wrong so all that to say, I wanted to start this way because I think we use the term soul and it can mean several different things, not that they're not somewhat related, but it can become a little bit confusing, like you, you kind of have to define what you mean. And I think that when Jesus uses the term, he has a very particular idea of what he means. It's an idea that originated in, in, in the Hebrew language and, and frankly, there's just not a word in English that really conveys the Hebrew word that I think Jesus is probably drawing on, the, the Hebrew idea, the, the Jewish idea that he's drawing on, uh, on what it means to have a soul, much less what does it mean to love God with our soul. Um, so I want us, in, in that light, to turn our attention to Matthew 16, 
And this is probably a really familiar passage, I would imagine. Um, but I'm going to read verses uh, 21 to 26. Get there. Here we go. So now I'm reading from the NIV. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone gain, give in exchange for their soul? So there's a lot going on in that passage. I think one of the reasons I really love this passage is because, like, Peter goes from this absolute spiritual high to, like, the very next story. It's as low as you can go. Uh, and it's just like such a Peter story for me because Peter makes so many mistakes and it's just so, it's just so interesting to me that um, on the one hand, you know, he's proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah for the first time in the gospel. And then his next recorded encounter is that Jesus refers to him as Satan because he like rebukes Jesus for something, you know, just can't imagine what the emotions that must have um, felt like for Peter. So anyway, our second question, in Matthew 16, Jesus accuses Peter of losing, uh, losing sight of the concerns of God and instead focusing on human concerns. So in your opinion, what human concern does Peter have in mind when he rebukes Jesus in verse 22? He Rebuke is a strong, I mean, it's a strong word. Like, you he know, just it's doesn't not just, want him to die. Say it again, by He doesn't want Jesus to die. That's right. And why don't you, I mean, that's a that's pretty a obvious point. answer, I guess, but like, you yeah. know, like why he wouldn't want Jesus to die, I mean, but, but, but what are some, like, concerns Peter would have about Jesus no longer being there, you think? That, mm, he hadn't learned all he needs to learn yet. Yep. Right, He's yes, he hasn't, that's one thing. Uh, there's probably some, some insecurity there, maybe, that he doesn't, right. He's he doesn't know on, all the things that he Jesus knows. Right there. What <laughs> else? We still remember what Peter said that? Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like his best friend, right? Like nobody ever wants to want to lose him, you know? He thinks yeah, he's that, losing him. That a, a, a beloved friend is not only going to die, but like suffer and be killed. Right. I mean, like those are, right. those are hard terms Jesus uses. That's right. What about from a, um, I guess I'll use it like a theological standpoint. Why would Peter be so surprised by what Jesus says? Do you guys know? Well, he thinks... God is lifting Jesus up as his son. He can't believe he'd let him die. He, he yeah. hadn't got that concept. Yeah. And that's why Jesus is upset too and rebukes him back because Jesus understands, but Peter doesn't understand. Yeah, so essentially, I think one of the reasons Peter has such a strong response and this is almost a way of maybe justifying Peter's response in a little bit, is that, you know, Jewish people have been talking about the Messiah from the beginning of Judaism, essentially. And especially in Peter's time, I mean, for, for several hundred years at that point, Jews had been expecting the Messiah to come at any moment. And for them, the Messiah was going to be God's anointed one like David. So they were expecting this warrior king who was going to come in and lead them to victory over their oppressors in the Romans and establish, you know, like the kingdom of Israel back as a unified kingdom. So like never had anyone ever, like any Jew ever taught that the Messiah would suffer, much less be killed. Like that, you know, that would be a completely foreign idea to a Jew about what the, like, what would happen to the Messiah. Like that would be unheard of. 
That makes so, sense. So, you know, for, for one, on the one hand, like that's why Peter is so surprised to the point that he would rebuke Jesus because like what Jesus has just told him is not only personally hurtful because Jesus is his friend, like it also completely goes against what Peter had been taught to believe about the Messiah. So and, you know, it's Peter's unbelievable convinced. to him. It's just unbelievable to him, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's just completely unbelievable. So like it, it makes it a little bit easier to understand Peter's boldness maybe in, in pushing back against Jesus because it just, like what Jesus just told him completely goes against everything that he had been taught to believe. Um, so like on the one hand is Peter's human concerns or, or some of the things Violet mentioned maybe, I mean, Jesus is his friend. You don't want to lose a friend. You don't want to lose somebody you care about. Two, you know, when Jesus is gone, that means it's Peter's turn to lead, and Peter's probably insecure about that, like most people are, because we, we never really feel equipped, some, especially in a situation like that. And third, like, Peter's been taught to believe one thing, and instead of listening to God in the flesh right in front of him, you know, Peter's just, he, he's very convinced of this thing he's been led to believe. Um, so Peter has several human concerns that prevent him from being able to see how God's at work in his midst in a way that like he just really can't comprehend and, and, and certainly would have never expected. Um, so the second part of my question is, is, you know, I don't think this is unique to Peter in any stretch of the imagination. Why do we let human concerns distract us from the concerns of God or or what are some human concerns that tend to distract us from, from God's concerns? If we are not comfortable, we want to be comfortable. And yeah. Some of those things don't let us be comfortable. We want to be successful. We want people to admire us, all that kind of thing. And that's not always God's plan or what he has in mind for us. Yeah, absolutely. And you also go through phases in your life where you think you need to have a lot of material things which you don't really need, but um, and they, they can be big distractions. Yeah, absolutely. Both, both they and the quest for they. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah, I, I think that's an interesting point, Tommy, uh, you know, to, to build off of Barbara's point, is that it's not necessarily the things themselves, it's like being able to strive for those things and thinking that attaining them will give us some like sense of meaning or worth or purpose. And like eventually you find out they don't, you know, I mean, but, but in the moment, it's hard to convince yourself of that. That's right. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. Any other things? Well, I think, one thing that, that, that I take away from, from this particular passage and kind of like I just mentioned, like Peter's intention isn't bad. Like I don't no. think he has a bad intention. It's a good intention in some ways. And I think that there's a lesson for us in that is that it's, it's not always like things that are openly idolatrous that are the human concerns that distract us from God. Sometimes it's like things that are, you know, it's our good intentions that actually distract us from what God is really trying to do. I mean, like, you think about the New Testament as a whole, Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious leaders of their day, I don't really know that they had bad intentions. They thought they had the best intentions. Right. It was just they had prioritized those intentions above actually being open to God moving among them, God being at work among them, and that caused them to lose sight of the concerns of God. Like, not bad intentions. We can have the best intentions of the world, but that doesn't mean that they always lead us closer to God. Um, so I think that's interesting. We grew up being told that, you know, like the streets of hell are paved with good intentions. Yeah, the How many way. times have we told that when we were little? Mm. Yeah, you're right. Um, so my third question, in verse 23, Jesus refers to Peter as a stumbling block. And I think we maybe we, we've talked about this a little bit, but in what way is Peter a stumbling block? So I, I'll give you a thought. Um, yeah. It won't maybe answer that question, but um, for the first time when you were reading that scripture tonight, I, I drew a parallel to Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by 
Satan. Um, and perhaps, and I think Jesus's response to Peter in this instance was the same as the one to Satan in the wilderness, get behind me, Satan. Um, Jesus likely, maybe, could have taken, I mean, he's foretelling his death and resurrection. In order to be resurrected, he has to die. Yeah. And maybe he had, and maybe he didn't, the opportunity to pull himself out, but he didn't choose that. Although he did on the cross ask God to, um, you know, if it's your will, you know, may I not die. But, but Jesus, Jesus died anyway and then rose the third day. Um, Peter's blocking what Jesus is here to do, which is to die on the cross for the sins of all of us. Yeah. So I don't know and I guess that. he thought, Peter, you know, so outspoken, he pull all the rest of the disciples along with his way of thinking and, you know, just be a mess. Yeah, that's you true. Know? I mean, his course, his course was set and, and Peter was offering an was being an obstacle to that, his purpose. Yeah. I just think it's really interesting, like the contrast between the story right before this, when Jesus declares that Peter will be that, the rock on which I build rock, my church. The foundation. Like, I mean, there's a play on words there. Peter's name, Petros, means rock. Right. So he goes on, uh, on the one hand from being the rock upon which Jesus will build the church to the very next story, he's this stumbling block that might actually prevent the church from being built, right? Like, you know, I mean, there's a huge contrast there, and, you know, I think it's intentional, um, but it's a very interesting detail to me, I think. Um, oh, yes. But, yeah, Tommy, I, I think you're exactly right. So my second part of that question is, is how can we serve as stumbling blocks to others? A hard question. I think we can set good examples and we've talked about people having a desire to have what we have, yeah. I, church, God, Jesus. The reverse is also true. If your actions and your words don't match, you know, your Christian beliefs, you can deter yeah. people from perhaps they you know, it's even worse. They, they might want it, and then they get a dose of something that's not attractive, and all of a sudden, you've completely turned them off. So, Yeah. I almost wonder if it's not like, you know, I mean, if it's not, if that's not a greater influence over people. The, the good example is one thing, but like, I wonder, if, unfortunately, if like the bad example isn't even more effective, maybe, or, or more, you know, um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Like I think um, a big way that we're stumbling blocks is when we actually don't commit ourselves to live out our faith with the boldness that maybe we, we really know we should, or maybe when we do those things that are hypocritical or, um, you know, I, I just think we get a little bit confused over what our witness should actually be. And we start to prioritize other things and then it makes it harder for non-believers or people that might be skeptical um, to, to want to have a relationship with Christ because they can't reconcile, you know, the teachings of Jesus with how they see some Christians live. Right. Um, and that's how we become a stumbling block, maybe. Yeah, that's true. Um, we have, like, they can tell we have other gods before us, as they say. Yeah. Then we're just going to climb to the top or do this or do that and it, it didn't always what we profess yeah well i'm going to skip the last part of that question so the the really interesting i'm going to skip to the last question i mean uh, the really interesting part of this passage comes in verses 24 to 26 which are kind of what are known as as jesus's discipleship teachings maybe and they're, they're teachings that he's already given once in, in some form or another in Matthew's gospel back in chapter 10. Um, but what do you make 
of, of Jesus' discipleship teachings in verses 24 to 26? Like, how do they challenge us to align our priorities? Well, here, let me do it this way. I'm going to give you my thesis, maybe, of what I think Jesus means here. So I'm going to read it again. Um, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So the last question I was going to ask is, what do we think Jesus is talking about when he refers to the soul? Because I do think Jesus has a specific thing in mind, perhaps. And what, what we're going to go back to on Sunday is, uh, I think when Jesus refers to the soul, maybe he's actually going all the way back to Genesis, to the creation story, when God forms Adam from the, the dust of the earth, and then he breathes life into Adam. And depending on what translation you use, the, the NIV says, and, and Adam became a, a, a living, um, oh dear, now off the top of my head, a living being, I think is what it calls it. Um, but the King James, and, and I'm sure other translations too, say Adam became a living soul. And what I think I'm going to argue on Sunday from, from the scripture is that like what, what Jesus has in mind when he talks about the soul is the fact that like the life we have, the only true life we have, is the life that's been given to us by God. It's like God's life living within us. And our problem as human beings is that we live in this fallen, broken, sinful world and there are all these other things around us that seem to promise life to us. So to the point Tommy made earlier or Barbara made earlier, you know, we can get caught up in material things. We want a nice house. We want the best job we can have. We want to see how much money we can put in a bank account or, or what kinds of things we can have. And, and, and seeking after those material things are the, are the way that we find our life, we find our meaning, we find our purpose. And when we do stuff like that, we're necessarily not finding our life in God. We've, we've created an idol. Um, and I think what, what Jesus is teaching us here is that if we, if we truly love God with all of our soul, what that means is we recognize that the, the only real life we have is the life that's been given to us by God. And that if we're going to be faithful to God, if we're going to be disciples of Christ, we have to, 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 to stay away from all these other things that seem to promise life to us. And instead, we have to focus our energy in, in every moment of every day of seeking after that life that God has given us, that, that life that dwells in us through the Holy Spirit, that life that allows us to take part in bringing the kingdom of God here to earth. Um, and I think that's what Jesus has in mind. You know, in this story, Peter didn't have bad intentions. He loved Jesus. He loved his friend. He didn't want to see anything bad happen to him. But what Jesus is trying to get the disciples to realize, and this is something he'll repeat to them two more times before it actually happens, is that if, if God's will is going to be done on earth, Jesus has to go to Jerusalem, knowing that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested He's going to be tortured. He's going to suffer. He's going to be crucified, and he's going to die. And for three days, it's going to look really bad. But every time he tells them, on the third day, I will rise, because that's what, it, you know, that's what has to happen for you to have the life that God intended you to have when he created creation all those years ago in the Garden of Eden. Like, this is how God solves the sin problem that actually keeps us from, from having the life that God offered to us, that God intended for us all those thousands of years ago. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That was good. Yeah. Does that help us understand maybe what, what Jesus means when he refers to the soul? Like, does that, yeah. did that make, I guess, did that connection make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Pastor Garrett, did you, at the start of the lesson tonight, did you say that uh, your understanding was that the soul 
as maybe even as Jesus used the word in the passage you just read, that the soul was not what uh, you said the one theory was that it was the immortal part of us. Oh yeah, I said that was like a, um, I think that's like kind of a, a medieval, well not medieval, but uh, like a, a philosophical idea that got inserted into Christianity maybe. But I would say, you know, I mean like, like Jesus is always, the resurrection is always bodily. It's a bodily resurrection. So, you know, right now we have a, a fallen, broken body, um, but, but one day we will be resurrected physically too. So I don't, I don't know that it's as neat that there, there's this body soul disconnect where there, you know, there's just two different entities. Um, you can talk it out another know. time, but I guess I, I guess I uh, would like to talk that through with you some more. I mean, to me, I think that the Bible speaks to the immortality of the soul uh, apart from any medieval philosopher. You know, the, the, yeah. you know, people argue whether it's a parable or, or not because he uses the beggar's real name, Lazarus, the beggar and the rich man, that story in the Bible yeah. about uh, what happens to them when the rich man's in torment. He asks, you know, can you go warn my brother so they don't come here as well? So it seems to me that Jesus in that story is talking about an afterlife situation yeah for what we would call the soul uh, do you not you don't see it that way well i guess i would say i have a, a different conception of what like eternal time looks like so you know i mean i guess like i, I think it's complicated i think like god exists outside i mean if, if god exists in eternity well you know eternity is not linear there is no beginning and end it's yes, just eternity. I agree with you. Um, and that, you know, what I would say is that, that, like, we wait for the day that Christ returns because that's when the living, you know, the, the, the dead will rise again in their physical bodies, maybe. And that, like, that hasn't happened for us yet because we're stuck in linear time. Um, but that, you know, when we go to be with God, we're no longer in linear time. We're, we're outside of it. We're in eternity. And that, you know, it's a little bit more complicated because if you're in eternity, there can never be a start date or an end date. Like, you know, you're just in eternity. Yep. And that I think that, you know, in heaven, the resurrected are already there because it's eternity. And that, you know, we're just limited in our perspective right now because we're stuck in, I'm not doing justice to, I guess, what I probably believe. Um, I guess I would say that the soul is or is immortal, but that like also if, if you're a believer and you die, when you're in heaven, your, your body's already with you because in like God's time, you know, God's already redeemed the, the saved, maybe the elect. It's, it's, it's complicated. Um, kind of showing myself my cards to be in a, I guess, a premillennialist, yeah, after type person. But you know, the, I guess I'm persuaded by the, the uh, verses where uh, Paul talks about the rapture, the way we would talk about it nowadays, maybe, saying that you know trumpet will sound and that the dead will be raised but there's another part where it says that uh, those that are alive when that happens will be transformed they don't have to go through death they'll be transformed they'll be uh, they'll receive basically a resurrection body their flesh that we're in right now will be changed yeah. To what I would call a resurrection body. But those that have passed already receive their resurrection body. And, and the sort of resurrection body matches up with the what I consider their soul in the presence yeah. of the Lord at the moment. I, I agree with you about, uh, you know, out, being outside of time, God being outside of time. And then, so I think everybody that's there, it's like, suddenly we're all there at once when that event happened. Yeah. Everybody throughout history. But uh, but for that reason that you talked about, I'm kind of getting way off. Way off. No, it's interesting. We, we'll have study. to get together and talk I about that sometimes. To like me, it's, it's one of those things that my mind always changes when I think about it because it's such a big idea that like I, I just, I recognize areas that I haven't really explored with it and it, it's just very interesting to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah.
Violet, were you going to say something? I just am thoroughly enjoying listening to both of y'all. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's interesting. There's there's different. I mean, you've got pre-millennials and post-millennials, and you've got different. I mean, it's a theories of of eschatology essentially, and eschatology is like the, the fancy word for the end of time, maybe. Um, but like how God will redeem the earth, um, redeem the world, redeem creation. Um, but it is interesting. I mean, I I would say you know, the story with Lazarus is it like it, they recognize it's Lazarus because it looks like Lazarus in some way too when he's you know up in, in heaven and, and and the same thing like with there there are other examples I think of what you're saying, Bill, in the Old Testament of people that that didn't die or at least Scripture says never mentioned that they died, but they went to walk with God, whether it's Enoch or whether it's Elijah, like they didn't die or at least he didn't say they died. It's like one day God just called them home. Like, you know, they had served their time and it was time for them to be with God. Um, and then at least with Elijah, you know, at the, at the transfiguration, Peter, John, and, and James recognize Elijah as Elijah, you know, I mean, and he has a, I don't know that it's fair to say that he has a physical body, but he at least has the appearance of having a physical body in that situation. And, and Moses the same way. Um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's very interesting, y'all. I think what's really interesting is that, you know, people can read the same Bible and the same scriptures and come to such drastically different conclusions, <laughs> you know, and like, you know, it, it's hard to refute either way. I mean, you know, like, um, it, to me, that's what's so interesting about the Bible is that, you know, it, there's so much to it. Um, and I think, you know, we're just imperfect and we're never actually going to be able to fully understand it until we get to heaven and, and God can, you know, fully reveal his word to us. Um, but yeah, but anyway, we've gone on for long enough tonight. Um, I'm really glad that you guys joined us and uh, I hope to see you Sunday. And if I don't see you Sunday, uh, I just remind you that we're on Facebook and YouTube later in the day. Um, and then also tomorrow, if you're in town at, at 1.30, we're gonna meet over on Westmoreland um, because it's Lillian Ridgeway's 99th birthday tomorrow, and we have a surprise drive-by birthday celebration that's also going to include several fire trucks, I think. So it should be a lot of fun, <laughs> and I know Lillian's really going to enjoy that. So um, if, you, if you're available tomorrow afternoon at 1.30, please join us for that. But I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Garrett. Yes. May I take, like, two minutes of levity? You know, we've been kind of heavy. And yeah, sure. When we were at the beach, we ate out on the patio on the ocean. It was Callie and Corey's birthday. Well, the, uh, we were sitting there eating. Well, the bottom of my shoe fell off. Well, everybody giggled about that. Corey picked it up and gave it back to me and sat down to start to eat again. And Corey said, I will never, none of us will ever forget this place. The place grandmama lost her soul. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> she was sounding so serious and it was a beautiful place and then she said that. So I thought about that as I was studying my lesson for tonight. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, another main soul. Oh, huh? Be on the lookout. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Well. Well, well thank you for sharing that, Violet. Thank you for giving us that moment of levity. <laughs> there's a there's a little sermon material for you. <laughs> that is true you're right yeah <laughs> you're right well i hope you guys have a good evening